Dr. Mia Grothman and this is Dr. Hunter Peterson. Hello. We are both naturopathic physicians over at Coeur d'Alene Healing Arts. And this is open forum, so thanks for coming. Um, Dr. Hunter is going to be leading the lecture tonight, but we're going to start off with getting some questions going. Yeah, yeah. So Dr. Mia and I, how the open forum works is um, this is first and foremost an opportunity to just have a discussion um, as a group, as a community. And so any and all health-related questions you have, um, you're dying to have answered. Um, we're going to spend some time at the end of the evening uh, looking at some of those questions and um, kind of giving our best response we can for you. So um, what we're going to do in a minute is start out by just kind of asking you, the audience, what you want to learn about beyond the scope of the lecture that you read about um, that we'll be presenting tonight. Um, so yeah, thanks Dr. Mia, and um, we'll do that towards the end. So um, Open Forum uh, is something that we've been doing for five or six years now. I started with Dr. Todd Schlaffer, my predecessor mentor, and he started that about 30 years ago um, when he moved here to Coeur d'Alene to begin our practice, Coeur d'Alene Healing Arts. And so um, I really like this because it's unscripted. There's no, you know, PowerPoint lecture. It's, it's really a conversation we're having. And I want it to feel that way, so raise your hand and, you know, kind of interrupt if you want to, you know, take the conversation down a little different path. Um, but everything we talk about tonight, in case, like, you missed it, I welcome you taking notes, but um, we will be recording it. And so it'll go up on our website, cdahealingarts.com. And there's a little bit of info about our clinic back there, a little rack card telling you a little bit about us and Dr. Mia and myself. So feel free to grab those. Um, video will probably be up in about a week. So, um, you know, won't be there tomorrow. But, um, yeah, I, I'm really excited to do this talk tonight. Um, autoimmune disease is something that's such a, a huge issue in our our country and something that I'm really excited to share my perspective about. Um, so, with that said, um, I am going to take some time to write down some questions. So this is that part where anything that you want to pop out there for us to discuss toward the end of the talk, um, shoot it at me. Yes? I heard that a huge amount of your immune system is dependent on your digestion yeah. and your gut. Yes. Uh -huh. How do our foods and our eating habits and lifestyle and everything kind of tie into all Yeah, we'll be talking about that tonight, so we'll cover that in great depth. Yeah. Yeah, what other questions? Yes. Um, autoimmune um, conditions that develop during the second half of life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I lived a very healthy life, and then I turned around 50, 55, and everything just started happening. There, and that's when I was diagnosed with something. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and we'll, we'll cover that as part of the scope of the conversation. Absolutely. Yes? My question is that once you go holistic for right. and clear out a lot of the bad and you start a new lifestyle of getting healthy, it seems that sometimes it's easier to catch something once you do the slightest thing, like your body gets more sensitive mm -hmm. um, to something that we would consider normal, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. So, just yeah. curious about that. Yeah, story. yeah, I can talk a little bit about. I, you probably <coughs> referenced Kelly more in relation to food. Would that be like a, a good way to respond? Yeah, to if question? I go all no dairy, but then yeah. I have one yogurt yeah. every now and then, then I yeah. react to it maybe. Something yeah. So like let me that. talk a little bit about food intolerances, or we'll we'll kind of okay. review that. Let me 
me tack that onto this question. Yeah. <coughs> sure. Yeah, what else? Yeah. Sure. Um, I don't know if you'd want to touch on this because I know you have a lecture coming up next month on dental issues. Sure. Uh -huh. um, but if you wouldn't mind talking about um, metal in the mouth, maybe. Okay. Yes. In some of your approaches uh, that you have in your clinic, how would they impact the thyroid, or how do you treat thyroid and thyroidism, mm -hmm. like Hashimoto's and Graves? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, uh, we can go into a little more depth at the end on autoimmune thyroid disease. Sure. Ideas about uh, fibromyalgia. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I've heard that uh, thyroid is kind of tied to the adrenals, and the thyroid is low, the adrenals are high, and it <laughs> Yeah, yeah um, I can briefly speak on that. Um, watch the lecture on our website that I did pretty, pretty comprehensively around that too. You'll, you'll hear a lot more. Okay. Okay. Any others? I'd like to ask at the beginning of your class, before we get started, any um, first time um, uh, observers for Open Forum who's here for the first time? Okay, welcome everyone for the first time, and those of you who've been here many a time, and see your faces, so thanks for, thanks for being here. Okay, so coming back to these, um, let's move into the topic about mm -hmm. autoimmune disease and naturopathic medicine. <clears throat> so. You know, maybe the best place to start is let's break down the words here. Autoimmune disease. So, autoimmune, okay, we're talking about the immune system, all right? And auto means our immune system, and disease means it's a disease of the immune system towards self. <clears throat> so, in other words, it is a disease process in which your immune system is causing a self-destructive response. Okay, so 
let's break that down a little bit. I like to kind of zoom in all the way to the cellular level and talk about what's going on there. And this is a blanket statement. It's not any specific autoimmune disease. It's the autoimmune process in general. So the immune system has all different types of cells in it. And its job is to protect us. Um, it's to make sure that any pathogens that get exposed to us, that get internally into our membranes, our tissues, are not able to proliferate and <clears throat> spread and ultimately harm us and maybe even kill us. Um, up until the last few hundred years, um, <coughs> infectious disease or infection was the number one cause of death. Um, so our immune system has a really crucial and important job to play, which is keeping us safe from fungus and bacteria and viruses and um, those sorts of microbes. And so how it works is when your body gets exposed to a virus, let's just say it's a virus, right? Um, you swallow some food, it's got some viruses on it, it kind of goes into the bloodstream, what happens? Well, first thing, these... Um, these immune cells, they're called antigen-presenting cells, we'll just call them those, there's several different types. They identify with that microbe and say, this is not self, this is non-self, this shouldn't be here. And there's a few other cells that can go attack that microbe right away. But what we're really focusing on here with autoimmune disease is what's called the adaptive immune system. And so with the adaptive immune system, that, that antigen-presenting cell takes a look at that microbe, it IDs it, it paddles off to our lymph nodes. And our lymph nodes are these really important kind of immune hubs. It's where um, a lot of immunological communication is going on. <coughs> and in the lymph node, the antigen-presenting cells kind of shows this around. And then we develop or we begin the development of this adaptive immune response. And you guys are probably mostly familiar with the term antibody. So an antibody is part of this adaptive or immune response. And uh, antibodies are one of the types of cells that are called B cells. And so one of the things that happens is that those B cells make unique antibodies specific to that microbe that just entered your body, that virus. And then you have this other set of cells called T cells, or we call them killer T cells. And those killer T cells kind of go out and they also ID the bug and they follow the antibodies. So then what happens is this process takes a couple, three days, and that's why when you get sick, it takes a few days to get over the illness because it takes a while to build this adaptive immune response. And those antibodies go in and they start to bind up those unique multiplying viruses. And those killer T cells come in and they knock out those viruses. They, 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 um, you know, they shoot oxidative species, really nasty stuff, and they kill it. Um, and then, you know, the infection doesn't spread and we get back to feeling normal. And there's all sorts of other immune cells involved, but I want to make this really simple. So... You, one might say, well, why doesn't the immune system identify with its own cells and say, oh, we need to build an immune response to this when it's our own tissue? Um, so there's actually, there is a process around that. We've described it in immunology, and it's what we call it is a tolerance response. So we do make antigen-presenting cells that look at our own tissue and they go to the lymph nodes. But in that process, there's a pretty specific methodology by which the immune system discerns, oh, this is our own tissue. There are certain aspects of it that it can discern that. And instead of making an antibody, that immune-presenting cells um, kind of goes into basically hibernation forever. Okay? So there's a very specific process by which the immune system knows we don't want to um, attack our own cells. We don't want to build antibodies to our own cells. We don't want to destroy our own tissue. And that's pretty important. <clears throat> so what happens in an autoimmune disease is that process goes awry. Um, we actually develop the antibodies, develop the adaptive immune response to our own tissues. Okay, 
Is everyone good with that concept? Okay. So there's a lot of ways of zoom back out. There's a lot of ways that this presents itself in medicine in terms of presenting symptoms and condition diagnoses. Um, you can actually go look for these antibodies to self, it turns out, for most of these diseases. Um, so let's give a few examples of these diseases. And it's interesting because autoimmune diseases don't necessarily attack all tissues. Most of them that we're aware of actually attack specific tissues. For example, um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis and Graves' disease attacks the thyroid tissue. Um, rheumatoid arthritis attacks the joints. Mixed connective tissue disease, polymyalgia rheumatica, these attack connective tissues and muscles. Psoriasis attacks the skin. Uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis attack the colon. Um, and these are just a few examples of, of tissue specific. Um, there are some that are less tissue specific, like Many have heard of lupus. Lupus attacks many tissues, the lungs, the joints, the heart, the gut. Um, so that's a more global one. Sjogren's syndrome is another more global one. Um, let's see, what are some other examples? Um, yeah, those, those, are, those are some of the most prominent ones we would see. So these are all different diagnoses, and uh, many of you have probably heard of um, a lot of these diseases or have one of them. And so um, once this autoimmune process gets kicked off, you basically have all sorts of presenting symptoms the patient might exhibit. And that's very specific to the tissue being affected. And I'm not actually going to go into all the details about in each individual disease process. It would take many hours. Um, and that's not why we're really all here. We want to get the general concept of what creates these processes, and what can we do about it, and um, how can we reduce symptoms and lead to a greater state of health. Um, so these autoimmune diseases, sadly, are expanding in frequency and incidence at a really rapid rate, especially in the developed world. Um, I did a little quick researching um, just to kind of see the statistics. It's approximately 30 million Americans, 30 to 35 million Americans have known diagnosed autoimmune diseases. So if you're looking at a population of about 300 million, um, that's one in 10 people. And that's known and diagnosed. I'm sure there are many more that are undiagnosed. Um, so really pretty epidemic proportions, um, these issues going on in our, in our society. Um, Internationally, I don't know quite as much about numbers. I do know that it is much more prevalent in the United States and in developed countries. Um, another big one that's especially in higher latitudes, I didn't mention earlier, MS. It's a neurological disease. Um, also autoimmune process, very, very prominent one. And so we do know that it affects developed countries a lot more. Um, we also are aware too that this is a relatively new phenomenon. And if you look at the medical literature from you know 100 years ago, we're not seeing many instances of these autoimmune processes. Very rare, hardly ever. And I think that says a lot about how our culture and society and way of living has transformed over the last couple hundred years. And we're going to get into a lot of detail about that tonight. Um, more generally speaking, we see that what our society suffers from, from a health perspective, unlike 100 plus years ago, is not acute disease. We, we have some of that, but we don't die from that. It doesn't limit us hugely. Our medical system is not dealing with that prominently. What we're mostly dealing with is, is chronic disease. And I would really describe an autoimmune disease as kind of the epitome of a chronic disease. If I'm really to be specific about terminology, I wouldn't actually say that you ever are completely free of an autoimmune disease once you've acquired it. I mean, remember our definition, right? You have created antibodies towards self. And those antibodies, that immunological adaptive memory, 
stays in your body for life. Um, so what we could say, I think, very truly and accurately, is that an autoimmune disease perhaps is not truly curable, but it can be put into remission, I believe, in a permanent fashion. And remission means you're essentially displaying no symptoms suggestive of an autoimmune process that, you know, you're experiencing a perfect degree of health. And I, and I do see that in patients, and that is possible. Um, so, questions a little bit more, um, just where we're at right now, Any, anything to add? Yes? I just have a question. Um, since the body is creating those specific antibodies, yeah. if you do something to um, rid the symptoms, I guess, so to speak, um, the body wouldn't get rid of those antibodies once they're developed and acquired, they're, they always stay? That's correct, yeah. On some titer, you might have those antibodies reduced. It depends on the type of antibodies. There are also several types of antibodies. But generally speaking, yes, you're going to have some positive marker. You know, it's like we're talking about vaccines a little bit. It's like a vaccine, right? Once you get vaccinated, you have lifelong immunity. What are we talking about? The antibodies you make to that specific microbe. That's the whole point of a vaccine. So, yeah, you have it for life, for sure. Do you have any idea of what causes the autoimmune diseases? Yeah, we're getting there. That's going to be most of what we talk about. <laughs> Good question. So, um, so I want to just take a moment to kind of talk about how conventionally autoimmune disease is approached. Um, because it's, it's, it's dramatically different from how I approach it. Um, so first and foremost, um, in conventional medicine, what I see, at least the patients I come in who have already had diagnoses of autoimmune diseases, is that they, um, there's really always the statement that, well, my doctor said that we don't know what the cause is. Um, we don't know what causes it. Um, and so I, I vehemently disagree with that. We, we, we can learn what causes it, but we need to be good detectives and we need to be good listeners. And that's where we're headed with this conversation. Um, so the thing that follows that is we don't know what causes it, but we know that you're in pain, we know that your life is limited, and we know you have these symptoms, so we want to reduce your symptom expression. So the therapy, the treatment, is designed to reduce symptoms um, of the process without really trying to address the underlying cause. Um, I'll use a term that I think is more fitting, which is symptom suppression. Um, so we're not really addressing what the body is telling us in this. We're just saying, let's get rid of the symptoms. And we'll start with the gentlest means. If those don't work, we'll go with a less gentle means. If those don't work, we'll go with a very severe means of suppressing those symptoms. Um, so it usually looks like this. Um, we start, I'll just use a typical model. There's obviously individual models for each disease process, but say we're using rheumatoid arthritis. So the first thing that might come up is say, take ibuprofen, which are anti-inflammatories, reduce pain. And that's great, and that might work for a little while. Unfortunately, anti-inflammatories, NSAIDs like ibuprofen, tear up the gut, they're really hard on the kidneys, they increase heart disease risk, right? So we are already dealing with some significant issues if we use something like that. I would say that's probably the most benign treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. Then if that's not effective, the symptoms keep expressing because so we're not treating the cause, um, we move into a little more suppressive, symptom suppressive medicines like steroids. So people have heard of prednisone. So someone will be put on oral prednisone, um, continue. And that may help the symptoms, possibly, but we're looking at really severe long-term consequences, um, degeneration of your endocrine or hormonal systems, major immunological complications, growth and development complications, aging complications, blood sugar complications. And these are almost guaranteed if you're to do a medicine like oral steroids lifelong. It's not a question of if, it's just when it happens. <laughs> so we're just basically, I mean, I think I read a stat in a study that being on long-term steroids reduces your lifespan by at least 10 years.
years on average. Um, however, oftentimes that doesn't work too. So then we go so far in conventional treatment as to actually going right to the immune system and shutting it down. Well, if the immune system is misbehaving, let's just turn it off. You know, let's shut the thing down. And so then you get to medicines like Plaquenil, methotrexate, um, these are some of the more common ones I see. There's a whole host of them. A lot of them have to be injected on a regular basis. And they're obviously more problematic when you go to these deeper level interventions because now you're shutting down the whole immune system. So you can't be around people with infections or you <coughs> acquire infections very easily. Your immune system has a ton of regulatory roles in the body. So not having an immune system is not great for the gut, it's not great for the hormonal endocrine system, it's not great for um, you know, different internal visceral organ functions. So those are, I would call, the more kind of extreme interventions. And many people come in to me on those drugs and they're having horrible side effects, having severe fatigue, having sleep issues, gaining weight, um, developing rashes, and, you know, whatever it is. That's one of the reasons I, I have these people come through my door. And then they're kind of downcast about it too because they say, well, my doctor says I'm just gonna take this medicine for the rest of my life. It's just, you know, that's what it is. Don't know what causes it. Um, you're gonna be on this medicine for the rest of your life and if it doesn't fix your symptoms, well, we'll try this other medicine. But no matter what, you'll be on doing this for the rest of your life. And I mean, that's, that's a hard, disempowering thing to hear. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of that approach, um, it's, it's really making a big assumption, which is that it's, um, it's okay to suppress the body's symptom expression, and that suppressing the symptoms outweighs the cost of the long-term complications of harming other systems in the body. And this is all okay because we don't know what causes the autoimmune disease. So we have these drugs, that's our toolbox to address them. Um, so, so that's kind of what I see going on out there. And I just, I think we can do a lot better in terms of how we can help people with this and how we can empower our patients to really be connected to their own health process. Um, and so I think that that conversation starts with really getting into more depth about what causes autoimmune disease. We have to start there. Um, so before I get into that, any questions about conventional approach to um, treatment? Okay, great. So what causes these autoimmune diseases? How do they get started? Um, there's a few hypotheses, and to be fair, some of these hypotheses are out there in the conventional medical world. Probably the one that's most familiar that they teach you in immunology class is um, a concept called molecular mimicry. And the idea with molecular mimicry is that, say we were talking about that virus earlier on, the virus comes into your body and you start to create the adaptive immune response. But that virus looks a lot like, say, a certain type of cell in your pancreas, say an insulin producing cell. Um, I, met, I forgot to mention diabetes, another big autoimmune disease. So say it looks like um, a, an insulin producing cell in the pancreas and through the process of going through that whole involution and kind of hibernation of that antibody cell, that antigen cell, that doesn't happen and instead we create an antibody which was originally for that virus but actually ends up being for our own insulin producing pancreatic tissue. And then we have initiated the autoimmune process. And this indeed does happen. In fact, one of the leading theories behind like type 1 diabetes in children is that this occurs, that we have this molecular mimicry when kiddo gets a viral infection or a bacterial infection. and we manifest an adaptive response by mistake to our own tissue. Okay. Um, I see this in adults too. I've had people come in and say, I had an awful 
gut infection. I had an awful, severe illness. It was really bad. And then about six months later, a few months later, <coughs> I started to develop the symptoms that now is associated with the autoimmune disease. It doesn't happen instantaneously, interestingly. The autoimmune process usually takes a few months to get rolling. Um, and that in conventional medicine is one of the main kind of theories described, and sometimes that might be asked about, often not. Um, you have to understand that many of these people don't get diagnosed early and the symptoms come on gradually, and we have to really go back and look at things closely to discern what the causative forces are. Um, another thing many people ask, well, is it, is it genetic? I, my mom had Hashimoto's and my grandma had Hashimoto's, and you know, so is it genetic? Is it just my genes creating this? I wouldn't use that term. I never like to use the term a disease is genetic unless it's a very specific, narrow set of incredibly rare diseases. There are some purely genetic diseases, but most are genes combined with environment, what the environment of the genes are, are in. And this is a word, epigenetics. It's a really important awareness in medicine and health. I did a lecture on it a few years ago. It's on, on the archives. Um, but it's an important concept to illustrate that rather we should use the term we can have genetic predispositions, we can have genetic vulnerabilities, but it requires a receptive environment to activate that genetic predisposition. Otherwise, say, you know, okay, your mom had, Ashima's grandma had it, you got it, but why don't your two other sisters have it? Right? If it's purely genetic, they would have it too. Right? So, that's this concept of predisposition, vulnerability, and the environment that the genes are in, in terms of how the genetics might play partial causative role. By the way, when I talked about autoimmune process, I should have mentioned, interestingly, it's about twice to three times as likely for it to happen in women as men. Um, some autoimmune diseases are more, even more likely in women. Some dis autoimmune diseases are roughly equal men and women. But I don't think there's any that happen more in men than women. That's just kind of an interesting stat. <clears throat> so that is the molecular mimicry hypothesis and the genetic hypothesis. Um, any questions about those? Yeah. Does blood type have to do anything with that? Um, I don't really think so. Although, to some degree, maybe because there has been studies about ABO blood type in different, all different diseases, and some of those autoimmune processes do show a little higher incidence in different autoimmune, in different blood types. But I don't, I, I don't have an in-depth way to describe why that is. Yeah. Yes? Do you think that the agricultural revolution, in particular the second one, and the pressures that exerted on our environment, in particular our physiologies, yeah. through the years that that may have epigenetically predisposed? Um, Absolutely. And, and when I made that statement about 100, 150 years ago to now, that is one of, in my opinion, a primary driving factor when we tie it into the gut-related part of this lecture that, that could be contributory, for sure. Yeah, and we'll get more into that in the back. Is there a reason why women are more susceptible? Yeah, you know, I think it's all speculation. Um, when I get into some more of the causes, I can kind of talk more about that, but it is somewhat of a mystery to me. Um, a lot of these genetic or, or gender specific diseases, um, my, my views are completely speculation. When I get into the core causative forces, I guess my argument would be that overarchingly women have more to deal with in these regards than men, but even then I'm not completely happy with that, so I really don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. I've heard a lot of those illnesses are triggered by physical, chemical, or emotional stress. Yeah, we're getting there, so we'll get there. Yeah. We're, we're getting to the big stuff. So, um, another hypothesis in terms of causation is that, if anybody heard of the hygiene hypothesis? The hygiene hypothesis is, is that, you know, certainly we can appreciate, you know, how hyper-sterile our culture has become and how, um, fixated on staying away from the filth and microbes we are. And, you know, to some degree, this has been a revolution in medical care. I mean, people died by the droves because of lack of hygiene in medical procedures. 
but we've really taken this as a culture with our children to a whole new level, and we, you know, follow our kids around with sterilizer bottles to make sure that nothing they touch is dirty. Well, turns out immunologically that playing in the dirt and mud and putting things in your mouth has a very intelligent function for the development of the immune system, right? We actually need those microbes in our gut and in our interfacing with our body to help the immune system be more discerning and more intelligent. Um, so the hygiene hypothesis is that we've created such a sterile environment that we've developed these amplified patterns of things like autoimmune disease and allergy because the immune system hasn't been allowed to develop correctly. And that is definitely, you know, I think a pretty valid theory that has a role to play in this. A very controversial topic um, that kind of goes with the molecular mimicry topic is vaccination. Um, and I don't think it's debatable. I think it is fact, and even conventional doctors would agree in saying that there are certainly some autoimmune processes we know for sure can be triggered as an adverse vaccine response. Guillain-Barre is one of the big examples of that. There's also a lot of other case studies and documented reporting. So a whole host of autoimmune processes that have been created um, through immunization. And what's going on in that context is, right, we're injecting an attenuated virus um, into the body, and then we're putting a bunch of other stuff like mercury and albumin. Basically, the whole goal of a vaccine is to get the immune system to rev up and respond to it so it can make antibodies. Well, if the person is predisposed, and if the person has a lot of inflammation going on in their body, it's possible that that can cause a molecular mimicry response where we actually instead develop antibodies to self. So that is possible. I've seen it in practice. Um, I don't see it commonly, but it's something to be aware of and to be thoughtful about if that consideration is part of your life. Um, and yeah, so you know, questions. What yes. about the overuse of antibiotics? Yeah, well, I think it plays more in with the gut stuff that we're going to get into in a little bit. But yes, I do think it plays a role, and we'll talk about it in the gut. Yes? What about flu shots? Yep, same thing. It's, a, it's an immunization. It's a vaccine. So same, you know, potential risk profile. I mean, would you recommend not using them? or? I don't recommend anybody do anything blanket statement around immunization. It's ultimately about individualizing the guidance and about patients being informed about what immunization is about, what concerns might be out there, what benefits might be out there. So I have some really good resources that I share with parents um, and I really encourage them to go do their homework and if they want to keep, you know, have an ongoing dialogue with me about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of clears out some of the simpler topics and maybe less direct causative forces. So let's get to the big ones. Um, okay, someone, uh, several people have mentioned the word stress already. And I'm going to use the term stress as a real blanket term, but we're going to get much more specific about what we mean by stress. So Really, our question we're asking about the cause of autoimmune is what is it that, that is the driving force that causes the immune system to lose discernment, to lose discrimination between self and non-self, right? That's our ultimate question. And in my clinical practice, um, it is probably the most often when I'm learning about my patients' stories that I find a major stress event in someone's life is the principal, if not one of the main uh, contributory catalysts to that loss of discernment from self and non-self. And the simplest way I can describe it is that the immune system becomes confused when major stress is going on. 
Um, and so obviously this really gets into how do we learn about each of our patients as individuals? How do we learn about the richness of their biography in terms of how it informs their health today? So if someone comes in with a diagnosed autoimmune disease, or even if they come in with a bunch of symptoms, no matter what, there's always a line of questioning that is, okay, you know, describe your symptoms and I'll kind of learn about all that. But, um, you know, share a little bit about when you first started noticing these symptoms. Um, okay, yeah, it's about 10 years ago. Oh, well, what was happening in your life then? Um, tell me a little bit about that. Let me think for a minute. And then we get into exploring some of, you know, the, the facets of what actually were causative forces. And a lot of times, what that discussion ends up meandering toward is, oh, well, around, right before that happened, um, that was when, you know, my mom was passing away, or I was going through a divorce then, or my child had a terrible illness, or I had this awful boss at work, and my, my work life was super stressful, and it was, it was you know, um, I hated what I was doing, you know, spending 50 hours a week doing that. Um, I was working 80 hours a week and raising three kids. Um, I had, um, you know, a really uh, deep, um, toxic experience in a relationship that was chronic and ongoing. And I had a lot of irresolution and sadness and anger about that. Okay, so. Um, we start to learn that indeed there's these really powerful times in people's lives that something really difficult was going on, something really stressful to the body was going on. And obviously the stressors I just mentioned as examples, these are not necessarily physical stresses, I mean a little bit, but really they're psycho-emotional stresses, right? Um, relationships, um, dealing with death and dying, dealing with conflict. Um, and, you know, whether or not we want to recognize it, this is a primary force of what influences our well-being and our health. And no matter what, if it's not immune disease process or anything, every patient I talk with, we talk about stress from the, the lens of our being, of our psyche, of our hearts, of our emotions, and how that shows up in our life in present day, but also in the case of trying to discern when something started, what was happening at that time. Um, and so that's, that's often something that shows up. Maybe sometimes it's, I got a horrible flu, or I took a bunch of antibiotics and I was hospitalized, and then I had all these gut issues. Um, you know, as a caveat, oh yeah, I was eating, you know, fast food 10 times a week, and, you know, hot dogs the rest of the time. I mean, so, we're going to be starting to talk about the gut here down the road. But, but yeah, I mean, these, these stress events, these phases in people's life that were really difficult, is often where we see that catalyst for the autoimmune process occur. And it's that loss of discernment from self and non-self, the confusion of the immune system, that we're really looking at. And, you know, if that was what initiated the autoimmune disease process, then... We also could say, well, why, why are the symptoms still here? You know, what's, what's keeping them here? Why is the body keeping expressing this not well, this imbalance, this disequilibrium? And oftentimes we come to find that maybe the stressors have changed, maybe they haven't. Um, but the way that the person responds to the stress is still there. And I think we should be really cute. We should be really um, clear about that concept that we all have stress in our life. It's actually for our species existence. It's, it's an adaptive response that we need to be able to have to be exposed to stressors and respond. But the way that we respond to stress and what we do with that stress, how we process it, how we let go of it, how we make sense of it, how we wrap it around our belief systems, that's something that's very unique to each individual. And that is the thing that I think ultimately is 
the culprit in driving and sustaining an autoimmune process. So this exploration by nature is incredibly individual to understand this about each person because we're all different. And our upbringings have created a lens through which we see the world that is absolutely unique to each of us. And the belief systems that are created around that are unique to each of us. And the compensations we create for those belief systems in terms of how we deal with our stress, how we interpret our stress, um, what it causes us to do in response to it, is unique to each of us. I would say that commonly, one of the things we do is we just avoid looking at it. We avoid looking at what is scary to us, what is not okay with us, what we're insecure about, what we're fearful about, what in our heart, in our emotional center, we're really uncomfortable with. Our culture is not really good about teaching how to be connected to your emotional experience and giving permission to explore that when we're raising our kids and be connected to it and know that it's okay and to be expressive of it. So a lot of us just, you know, avoid it, we push it aside, we go distract. Um, and that strain that's psycho-emotionally imprinted on the body um, is not going anywhere, we're just not paying attention to it. So the body in its intelligence and eloquence starts to express that irresolution, that tension, that, you know, lack of being in integrity with itself in other ways, often in physical ways. The term we use in, you know, medicine is we say it somaticizes into the physical body. And very much, you know, an autoimmune process is a, a key example of how that could happen. It doesn't have to be an autoimmune process. It could be headaches. It could be tight muscles. It could be, um, you know, uh, diarrhea, right? I mean, we somaticize stress in all different ways, and we all do it. It's not a matter of if we do it. We all do it. It's just about being able to be observant enough and connected enough to your own inner process to understand how it happens and to be conscious when it's happening so that we can choose to do something different about it or choose to make a different choice. Um, so I don't want to lose you guys too much and get too into this concept because it is very individual. And the best way to do this work is on an individual basis in a therapeutic relationship with, with a patient one-on-one. -on -one. But that work of being a real empathetic listener and building trust in the therapeutic relationship to be able to learn those deep, dark, shadowy places in ourselves and how that informs our health is a really important part of treating the autoimmune process. And at the end of the talk, I'll go into some details about what I would suggest on this, you know, psycho-emotional stress thread of the causative forces could be really good practices to implement um, as a way to go about the resolution of an autoimmune process. Um, so what kind of questions are there around that topic? Any? Yes? How does depression and... <laughs> anxiety disorder tie in with what you were just talking about? I would say what I was just talking about is the definition of depression and anxiety disorder. It is that. It's just another expression, right? You're not having an autoimmune disease. You have this very clinical, you know, sterile term called depression or anxiety. And I have a lot of people come in and say, oh yeah, I have depression. And they're kind of expecting like, okay, give me the treatment. Well, because that's what they're accustomed to, is just coming to the doctor and saying, oh, I'm depressed. Oh, okay, well, let's try these different meds to take away your feelings. Right? The feelings are the, the clues, right? That's what teaches us about what in one's life, what beliefs, what scenarios, what relationships has led to the, the development of those feelings that we're just blanket labeling as depression. We need to explore those things, understand them better, what informs them, and help someone and help guide someone to a process of reframing their life or developing tools to come at life in a more balanced and self understanding way. Yeah. What else? Any questions about that topic? Yes. When you have conditions like vitiligo, 
Yeah, another autoimmune disease. The LIGO, and sure. then I think the most frustrating for me is getting a diagnosis of LIGO, and then later Hashimoto. Yeah. And so there's a whole list of them. And yeah, a lot of people manifest multiple autoimmune diseases. And again, I think that makes sense, right? Because if you're predisposed to having this kind of immune um, confusion, then if the underlying causative forces leading to the manifestation of the first autoimmune disease aren't being looked at and addressed, then we're gonna, the body is gonna do what it does, which is give clues, give feedback to us, and manifest more complex pathology or more diverse pathology. So that, that's how I would frame understanding that. And I do see a lot of people with multiple autoimmune processes. Yeah. Totally. Okay. So um, if we move into the kind of final causative area that I think is really crucial and is a huge one as well, um, we need to talk about inflammation. Um, so inflammation, maybe just another understanding of it is we all need inflammation in our body um, to, to, to live. I mean, it's, it's really crucial to the immune system to be able to mount an inflammatory response to deal with microbes. Um, and that's the primary way, you know, that the immune system creates inflammation. I mean, another way is overuse, right? We like work too hard and our muscles get achy, our joints get sore. I mean, that's inflammation. Um, but the main way that most of us get inflammation in our body is um, through our biggest exposure to the outside world, which is to our gut. Um, so we can breathe stuff in, we can touch stuff that can cause inflammation, but by and large it's when we ingest things into this big tube that runs through our body. And I guess I should step back a little bit and say, Okay, well, why, what does inflammation have to do with autoimmune disease? So inflammation, another word I would use, is the immune system being activated. Um, it's one and the same, right? Inflammation, you can't have inflammation without having an activated immune system. And that activated immune system, when it gets really activated, and when it's activated highly or activated all the time, you know, it, it can make some mistakes, right? So this whole antigen-presenting antibody conversation we had. So say like, you know, that's happening, you know, once every 10 hours. I'm just totally giving it what's happening all the time, really. Say it's happening once every 10 hours. Okay, well, what are the likelihood, you know, your immune is going to make a mistake? Pretty low. What if it's happening instead of once every 10 hours, once every millisecond? It's happening all the time to a huge degree. Wouldn't one say that it's probably more likely if it's happen happening millions of times over more often than it should, that it's more likely that a mistake will get made in the identification of self versus non-self, right? So that's essentially this principle is that when there's, a, when there's a very large baseline of inflammation in the body, or even when there are acute events when inflammation really increases, that's the example of the mimicry hypothesis, right? You get a really bad infection, yeah, a lot of inflammation from the immune system to deal with that microbe. Well, it turns out why I think we have such epidemic proportions in part of autoimmune disease, besides what I talked about with the stress response, is that we're a lot more inflamed um, as a culture, as a you know, species, than our ancestors were. And I think the biggest culprit in that is what's happening in our guts. And it makes a lot of sense when we tie our gut to inflammation to immunity because about 70% of your immune cells and your immune tissues are in your gut. Right? So this is this idea that when I talked about the hygiene hypothesis that how our immune systems learn how to become intelligent and develop is by playing in the dirt and putting things in our mouth. It's because we're getting all these bugs in our system and we're getting an opportunity for our immune system to learn how to pay attention to what's good and bad. And so what happens, let's just take an example of, you know, eating um, a piece of broccoli versus 
eating um, a piece of white bread. Okay, so when you eat a piece of broccoli, you chew it up, you swallow it, it goes in the stomach, digests, goes into the small intestine, and gets broken down. And the breakdown process is complex, right? There's enzymes, but it turns out that there's a lot of bugs there. Um, those bugs help the breakdown process, and in turn, they feed on the broccoli. And depending on which bugs preferentially like broccoli, you have certain bugs in higher proportions than other bugs in your gut. But eventually that broccoli breaks down, and in the gut there's immune presenting cells there, and also in the bloodstream when it gets into the lymph, which is the immune system, and then eventually into the bloodstream, you have immunological cells there too. And what they're doing is they're looking at the broccoli and they're saying, especially if it's digested all the way, oh, this is, uh, this is not hostile. This is something that's not going to harm me. And so what gets mounted is a T-cell mediated. It's called T-regulatory cells and TH17 response. And that you make an antibody to it, but the antibody is not one that brings in the killer T-cells, right? It doesn't say... This is bad, we've got to get rid of it. Let's mount a big infl inflammatory response. So when you eat the broccoli, there's no inflammation. You just get all these great nutrients and fiber and help your gut flora be healthier and help your gut lining be healthier. And it turns out our, ancest our, our ancestral diet, things like broccoli, were about 80% of our diet, right? Um, fibrous vegetables, root vegetables, nuts and seeds, whole fruits, these kind of things. But mostly vegetables. Okay, let's use the other example. Let's use the white bread example. So when you chew up and swallow the white bread, goes into the intestines, starts getting cleaved by enzymes. And additionally to that, the bugs there are chomping on the white bread, and you know, there's a different set of bugs that really like that white bread. Turns out that these bugs um, are not the nicest ones to have in your immune system. They, they, the immune system doesn't really um, stay in a very calm state, I'll put it that way, when these bugs are prominent. Um, Candida, maybe you've heard of that, it's a fungus. C. difficile. Um, Streptococcus. Um, these are some examples. There's many, there's thousands of kind of bugs in your gut. There's more bugs in your gut than there are other cells in your body. There's actually nine times more bugs in your gut than there are cells in your body. So we are 90% bugs, like literally. Okay, so they're a big part of our health. And it turns out that the immune system gets its intelligence in large part from those bugs. It talks to them and you know has this conversation going on. And it's one of the most important ways that our immune system learns how to stay in balance and learns how to be properly reactive to what it's exposed to. These are bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, you know, this kind of stuff. So anyways, the white bread, those bugs that aren't, don't get along with the immune system well, they really like that. And so you're going to make more of them. You're going to make more of the candida, more of the streptococcus, more of the C. diff, right? You're, they're going to take over more of the terrain in the gut. But on top of that, those white breads also, you know, are going to not often digest that well because they've been altered a lot, agriculture's changed, um, they've also been stripped of nutrients, which doesn't really help for a lot of other reasons. But um, they maybe have a gluten content 10 million times more than our ancestral grains did. So there's this gluten antigen in there that is like in massive proportions and the immune system kind of freaks out about it. And these antigen presenting cells start to um, drive an inflammatory response. They start to say, this is hostile, this shouldn't be here. And so now we have an uh, inflammatory response happening in the gut. And if it's happening in the gut and it happens over and over again, say you eat that white bread every day, you eat it a few times a day, well now, you're having so much inflammation going on in the gut that the gut lining starts to break up. And those bugs that are keeping the gut lining healthy, they're all changing, and the nasty ones get in play, and they're not keeping the gut lining healthy. And you start to make big holes in your gut. And all of the enzymes that are part of your gut lining, they start to go away. And then you have this inflamed, leaky intestinal lining. 
And once you have that, then this wheat bread that you're eating that's already inflaming your gut, now it gets to go in your bloodstream and start causing inflammation and not completely digesting and leaking through these big holes and causing an even more hostile response. But instead of it being in the gut only, now it's in the bloodstream, now it's in the tissues. And so in this ramped up version of inflammation, stuff can go wrong with the immune system. We can start to get maybe the beginning of an autoimmune process. We can have all other things happen too. We can get a rash. We can get um, gut specific symptoms. We can get headaches. We can get migraines. We can get painful menstrual cycles. We can get anxiety, depression, disrupted sleep, right? I mean, the list is infinite. So by no means does inflammation automatically equate to autoimmune disease. Again, remember predisposition. That's a big concept. But, but most of the time, this inflammation that gets going is going to cause other symptoms. Kind of like when we were talking about stress, that it's not necessarily going to create an autoimmune disease. It's going to cause other symptoms like anxiety or depression or uh, compromised digestion. Um, which is interesting because now we're talking about the gut. I have people come in all the time that eat really, really well, but they're stressed all the time. And one of the main responses of the stress in the body when it's chronic is to turn off digestion, is to stop putting out enzymes, is to stop giving blood flow to the gut. So a lot of people through stress actually end up compromising gut function and creating inflammation in that way. And that's a huge, huge issue. It's almost more common than food issues, in my opinion. It's important to mention. But in this other model I'm using, basically, you know, the white bread is a example of kind of a <coughs> just a, a window dressing for all these other foods that we call processed food um, that are inflammatory for many people and most people, especially when consumed in large quantities. So this process, I mean, of what's happening in the gut eventually leads to an overactive immune response of the body, and that overactive response eventually leads to some mistakes in some people that causes an autoimmune process to amplify and start. And again, once that process starts, the question is what keeps it going? You know, what's, what's, what's sustaining the autoimmune process? Um, so I think one person also mentioned antibiotics. Antibiotics in their own way can be very destructive to the gut because we talked about these bugs in our gut being really important to keeping the immune system in balance. So when you carpet bomb those gut bugs with an antibiotic, you totally disrupt this very elegant organization of the microbes there, and it completely reorganizes itself, sometimes in a very harmful way. So antibiotics are not a good thing in my opinion. I've only had a handful of patients, you know, through my advice, take them in my career because there's way better ways to treat infection without antibiotics and they can create a lot of issues, a lot of dysregulation of the immune system. Steroids also majorly impact the gut bugs. So ironically for treating an autoimmune disease with a steroid, you're perpetuating the autoimmune process by suppressing the symptoms with a steroid. Same thing with immunosuppressive drugs. Um, so medications can certainly impact this. Um, Stress, as I said, can certainly impact this. But the biggest thing, I think overall, the biggest thing is food. Um, and again, it's, it kind of baffles me. Like if people, rheumatologists usually the ones treating autoimmune disease, but often gastroenterologists when it's gut-specific autoimmune, like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, there's never once a mention of, oh, you know, Maybe you have sensitivities to these different foods. Maybe you are having an inflammatory reaction. Maybe you have issues with the balance of your gut. They don't ever talk about diet. This is, in those disease processes, primary in resolving the symptoms and leading it into remission. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. So this is kind of personal story, guys. But um, yeah. yeah, a couple weeks ago, I came back from Italy and had a, a UTI infection. And because I tried to do the holistic path, I waited a few days trying to take, you know, I don't know, cranberry juice and some other stuff. Sure, sure. And, and then that, I, went, I had to go to the doctor because it was so painful. Yeah. And they gave me an antibiotic. 
and nine days later, my body reacted so that I, it looked like I had chicken pox from toes to my neck. And it was so painful that against my will of vaccinations and stuff, I went to the doctor and they gave me a steroid. Um, and so I just, I question, when you're wanting to do the holistic path, how do you sit in pain and nurse common things like a UTI or an allergic reaction? So I think that's my frustration with... Well, I treat them all the time. Very, very successful. <laughs> Super high rates of success. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, then I'll have to think yeah. about that later. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of my patients come in for chronic illnesses. I mean, they should because that's really what conventional medicine is not good at treating. But I would argue in this case, it's not the best way to treat acute illness either. Yeah, and I mean, we treat probably 15% of my patient load is acutes. You know, we leave a lot of space for that in our schedules to accommodate because, yeah, people have UTIs or bronchitis or pneumonia or, um, you know, lacerations or abscesses that we need to treat. And, um, yeah, we can do that so well with naturopathic medicine. There's all sorts of powerful tools. Okay. Good yeah. 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 Um, so, um, so I guess, you know, I really feel like that is a really comprehensive synopsis of the informative processes of causation. What causes an autoimmune disease? And I like to say this with any chronic disease I'm working with, maybe these questions we've asked up here. If someone asks, what do, I, what do you do for high blood pressure? Well, I talk about the causes. What do you do for uh, eczema? Well, I talk about the causes, right? Why? Because that's what matters. You know, we, want, we don't want to just get rid of the symptom and leave the underlying reason the body is expressing this imbalance in place because what's going to happen is the body is just going to manifest in a different way probably in a more pathological way a more harmful way right it's very wise um, so like it or not in how we live our lives if we're unwilling to confront and look at the root causative forces nature's laws are going to show us that it's going to our body's going to create a louder more prominent way to tell us that this way you're living your life, this way of doing things, this way you respond to stress, this way you're eating food is not serving you well. It's not alignment with your most authentic, you know, expression of self. And so, yeah, when we get into treating this, which we kind of already talked about how to treat it, but it involves, you know, really looking at some difficult things and really, um, being willing to embark on some complex change. But most importantly, it, it involves being very self-curious, right? Again, we talked about this concept of somaticization, the body transforming stress into physical manifestations. I bet if, if we were all honest about it, we could say that we are aware of something out of alignment, even if it's just intuitively, way before a symptom goes into a physical expression or a prominent physical expression most of the time. And so I think if there was one thing that we could all work on cultivating, it's on being better observers of self um, as a blanket statement of treatments, right? Whether it applies to diet, stress, um, any sort of illness, um, how are we conscious of what we're, our experience is, and where do we create space in our lives to be, be conscious of that and to devote time to being understanding of that. Because if we do that, if we really dedicate the cultivation of a practice, it could be many practices that allow that. It could be a meditation practice. It could be a spiritual or prayer practice. It could be seeing a counselor. It could be, um, you know, having very vulnerable, courageous open conversations in relationships with loved ones, with spouses, with family members, with close friends, right? Where you actually talk about, you know, the forces influencing your life, what you're observing, and, um, you know, really, really make that a priority in how you walk through the world. And I think, you know, what's good, the body knows how to take care of itself, right? So it's how we get in the way of it. Um, Chronic disease does not manifest um, spontaneously. 
it manifests because, because of patterns we've created that aren't in alignment with our greatest good, our greatest expression of self. And so it's looking at those patterns, understanding those patterns, not with judgment, but with curiosity. Um, so, you know, in, in terms of those, those regions I've covered so far, those big causes, stress, gut, immune system inflammation, you know, what, what kind of questions are there, just to begin with? Anything out there? Yeah. I have a question. For something acute like that, like she was describing, yeah, sure. if you wanted to avoid the allopathic path on that, some people take like, silver, they take yeah, sure. water, they take hydrogen peroxide. Right. That would negatively impact your gut flora also, though, wouldn't it? Yeah, I don't use those types of things. Right. Yeah, so, it would be treated individually, right. um, and it would totally depend on the presenting unique symptoms. Right? Just like every autoimmune disease is treated individually, in my opinion, necessarily so, so does every acute illness. I do not have a formulaic approach to any, any process that I work with. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of people that are It's possible. It's, yeah, it's it's possible you may need to avoid certain overly stimulating immunologically active compounds, but I would say that's really the exception of the rule. I don't think it's common. I think it's very rare that that's really true. I think someone who's more active in their autoimmune process, you might need to be careful. But I wouldn't identify specific compounds. I think again, it would be a really individual conversation. And, and, and with natural medicine, minimal of a worry. Yeah. yeah, Laura. Do you think lectins are a factor? Yeah, I mean, lectins, if we were to talk a little more about the gut, you know, maybe we could roll a little bit into treatment here and say, okay, well, if gut and inflammation is a big part of this, like, how do we make the gut healthy? How do we heal the gut? Part of that's an individual conversation and may involve supplements and medicines. But part of it is, you know, obviously diet, like eating the correct foods um, that is individual to, to you. Um, so lectins are these really highly immunoactive substrates on individual foods, and individual foods have individual lectins. So there's um, a pretty popularized book right now called Plant Paradox. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe. It's all about lectins. It's about how we should avoid lectins in what we eat and we'll have healthier guts and healthier immune systems. I think part of that is true, but I would personalize it more. I would say that there's actually, this lectin science has been around a really long time, for over 100 years, and more popularly so since the early 90s. And it was popularized by a colleague, uh, Dr. Diodamo, it's called the blood type diet. But it's all about lectins. It's about individual scientific experiments of looking at different people's responses in their bloodstream to lectins based on their blood type. So one of the main theories that I use as a starting point dietarily with my patients is understanding their blood type as a, as a means to begin to select the foods that are most appropriate for them. And so from that standpoint, that's keying really directly off the lectin hypothesis. Um, so the idea that if you're, use, if you're eating a food that has lectins that are really hostile to your unique immune system, that if you do a lot of that, you're gonna drive a lot of inflammation. Whereas certain foods that have lectins that are friendly to your immune system that cause a tolerance response, those should be okay to eat in unlimited quantities. So yeah, that's one theory that's really helpful. Um, yeah. um, with uh, probiotics, does that help take into keep your gut healthy, I mean, or does it matter even if you're bringing that yeah, stuff in? Yeah, I would say that probiotics can be helpful, <laughs> but they're very not much not core. You know, you, you, you can't weigh like, well, I could take a probiotic or and I could stop fix. eating junk food, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the probiotics are drop in the bucket. Okay. Um, and so it's, it's good. I mean, I use probiotics a lot, and that's one thing in the autoimmune process I might definitely recommend, and they, they can be helpful, but really your gut microbes are informed primarily by the foods you put in your body and stress. 
Um, that's what shapes them, and to some degree, predisposition. Um, and then, you know, harmful events like antibiotics or really bad illnesses or whatnot, or traveling and getting a parasite, you know, these kind of things. Yeah. There's a lot of diets out there, right? We're not going to go into depth tonight. I have many, many videos on the website about different kinds of diets and go into depth about them. Um, and so, you know, many can apply. There's one called an autoimmune diet. Um, it's pretty good. It's really limiting because it takes any potential inflammatory food or most of the potential inflammatory foods and tells you to avoid them. And that's just, you know, tough on a lot, a lot of people to do lifelong to employ a diet like that. Um, so, you know, more importantly, I think we got to get back to this piece of, well, what if your gut is really compromised? What if you got this leaky gut with, you know, all the barriers are broken down? How do you repair it? Um, you know, there's a lot of medicinals that can do that. So someone mentioned probiotics. Um, there are certain amino acids like glutamine that can really help with that. Uh, there are certain herbs like slippery elm and DGL that can help with that. Um, sometimes we just got to go knock out some of those bad bugs. So we may actually use some herbal anti antimicrobials to get rid of the problematic ones so we can get the good ones to fill in. Sometimes there's an issue with um, peristalsis. The muscles aren't working well, so we've got to really help stimulate those muscles to work better. Um, all sorts of good ways to do that. Castor oil packs, exercise. Um, sometimes there are medicinals that will help break down foods more completely, especially when we're stressed out and our pancreas and our liver and our stomach aren't making much enzymes and acids. Sometimes we got to give agents that will help break down our food better so that um, we metabolize and the, the gut dynamics are more healthy. Um, so these are all potential interventions, again, always on an individual basis. Um, so from the gut perspective, those are some really important concepts. Yeah. How do you test for those? What are you testing? Is that blood work? Is you know, a lot of testing is not all that necessary. Um, you know, clinical, again, being a really good listener and taking time with your patients is so, so helpful. Um, I really deeply feel for my conventional colleagues because they don't get to spend time with their patients. They're using an insurance model that requires them to get 10 minutes of FaceTime, maybe a new patient's 30 minutes. How are you going to learn someone's life story in the unique forces that impact their health? You're just not going to. Um, and so I take 90 minutes with a new patient and follow-ups are at least 30 minutes. So we can really get a sense for what's going on. And it's really only when we get stuck that we use things like food allergy testing or stool testing and those types of things. Otherwise, I think we do a pretty good job, you know, getting at the bottom of it with knowing the person. Yeah. Huh? You hear as, uh, as people age, they, uh, their hydrochloric acid production kind of goes down. And Absolutely. You really break down your minerals and your food. So is that something that would be helpful to supplement or stay away from? I do, I do a lot of um, stomach acid support, not necessarily supplementing hydrochloric acid, but using digestive bitters, mm -hmm. uh, practicing food hygiene, taking your time to chew and be relaxed when you eat. Um, but yeah, a lot of older individuals, I'm more prone to recommend bitters or hydrochloric acid. For sure, and it can be very helpful. By the way, I didn't really talk about how you test for autoimmune diseases. I mean, there are testing methods. You go and look for the antibodies, basically. Um, not all autoimmune diseases can you test for antibodies. Some of them are just a clinical diagnosis, and it's when all the symptoms look like it. We, we clinically diagnose an autoimmune disease. Some autoimmune processes have inflammatory markers that really elevate, and that's part of the diagnosis, C-reactive <coughs> protein. Um, but most of them have these antibodies specific to the autoimmune process. So that's one of the confirmatory ways we figure this out. Yeah. Um, yeah, so well, fire tonic. I heard about that at one of these things, and sure. I bought some out there, and I take a little bit of it, you know, because it's supposed to be good for, you know, flu season. And all this. But I don't really understand what I think it's doing other than 
I heard it's good for you. So what what is the deal with well, I, I would, fire tonic? Is yeah, so if you're talking like about the immune benefit, I would do yeah. this, you know, piece of appreciating the modulation of the gut as a means of modulating the immune system. So if you look at what's in those fire tonics, it's a lot of digestive stimulants, it's a lot of, you know, gut-friendly bugs, fermented, there's, you know, apple cider vinegar in it. Um, so there's a lot of um, gut-activating um, kind of balancing compounds. Gut-activating, what, what does that mean exactly? Stimulating stomach acid, um, kind of working with immunological kind of communication in terms of how those herbs work and food-based compounds. Yeah. So that's the way, that's the mechanism I would propose of how it's helpful. And there might be a couple of direct herbs that are associated with the immune system. Yes. Yeah. You hear about herbs and things that are called adaptogens? Where yeah. If your immune system is too revved up, it'll slow it down. If it isn't revved yeah. up, it'll rev it up. Right? Yeah, there's several of those. we got to be careful with those because some of them are contraindicated in autoimmune processes. Some of them can actually activate the immune system too much, kind of like one of the earlier comments. Mm -hmm. But many of them are safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I don't like vegetables. Does that mean I'm going to die? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, again, just look at, you know, like how you were evolved, how your intestinal system was evolved to function. It was evolved to function on a lot of fiber and a lot of vegetables. So. If you eat a diet that's very low in fiber and low in vegetables, you're predisposing yourself to a lot of imbalance in your digestive system. And that can lead to, you know, a lot more downstream problems. I mean, naturopaths like to focus on the gut as the seat of health, right? Because everything starts there, kind of. Immunologically, everything starts there. What we're made of comes from there. If that process is compromised, then downstream everything else is compromised in the body. So it's, yeah, gut health is a big deal to me. I talk about it with everybody. We talk about food always <coughs> with every every person that I work with. Um, so yeah, I would, you know, generally, if you were to ask me to give a blanket statement, eat mostly plants, predominantly vegetables, and whole foods more generally. So when you look at the foods, you can tell the plant it came from. And sparingly use really clean animal proteins. Um, I mean, that's that's how we should all be eating, um, right? Unfortunately, the average American eats 200 pounds a year of sugar, excess sugar, right? Processed sugar, 200 pounds. Like that's like half a pound. It's more. It's like three quarters of a pound a day of just sugar. Like it's like it's taking a you know, it's taking a cup of sugar pouring it down your gullet, but that's what we, our processed food diet, that's soda, alcohol, um, you know, baked goods, refined grains, potato, refined potato, refined corn, that's, that's what most people eat all day long. No fiber in there, they've stripped out all the nutrients. Um, yeah, so it, it really messes up our gut, and I was saying, you know, my theory about why we have chronic disease, that's a big part of it, right, now versus in the past. That's what's killing us. And it, it's not just the gut, it's heart disease, um, you know, it's strokes, it's heart attacks, it's um, diabetes, it's high blood pressure, it's obesity, right? That's what we have going on, and it's largely because of how we eat and because we're super sedentary. We don't move. You know, um, one of the most important ways, you know, we, we haven't really got into talking about the stress conversation and real practical applications of how to get beyond where we get stuck from a psycho-emotional standpoint. Well, many of the patients, when I ask them that, what helps you feel more centered and more grounded, they say, oh, when I exercise. Yeah, right? But how many of us exercise regularly? How many of us have that as anchored as a ritual practice in our lives? Many of us don't. Um, it's one of the most powerful things you can do for your health. And it also does great things for circulation and, you know, um, all of these other, you know, chronic issues that we create. Um, how many people have had a mindfulness practice or dabbled in it um, and have been able to experience the calm and the peace and the centeredness and the present moment connection that you experience after 
praying for half an hour, after meditating for 20 minutes, after just spending 10 or 15 minutes doing deep belly breaths, you know, doing abdominal breathing. It's incredible. Um, how many people, you know, have hung out and played with children or have children of their own and just been able to get into that mode of like play, right? Of, of just like being in the moment and playing and having that be all that there is, right? We, we by nature, we need to play. We don't do that a lot in our culture, especially as adults. Um, we are also very creative beings by nature. I mean, you know, like, again, you see this in kids that are always creating and exploring and, you know, organizing things or moving things or whatever. I mean, painting, playing music, listening to music, drawing, sculpting, um, you know, so many ways to be creative, and that's such a fundamental expression of self. This is something we all should be doing and having a practice around in our life. Um, well, I also would say we're very, you know, communal creatures by nature. And one of the ways that we gain a sense of well-being is by having a sense of belonging, having a sense of feeling connected, of feeling loved, of feeling cared about. So, when you know we're isolating ourselves all the time, when we're not sharing our struggle with the people we trust and who care about us and love us, you know we can get in a very, you know, isolated, toxic space in our body and in our heart and our mind. So it's really important to have community, to build community, to be in connection with community. Um, this is also really crucial to our well-being. Um, now. We could go into all sorts of detail about how we relate to stress individually, how we respond to it. Um, unfortunately, that's not something we can cover in the scope of our conversation because it is so unique to each of us. So the way I would guide one's work in that is going to be highly individual based on our dialogues. But what I can say is a lot of our past traumas and experiences shape how we reflexively respond to the world, how, what our habituations are. Um, and so there are some really good tools and ways to access that. Um, and so I often will recommend a couple of really cool therapies. Emotional freedom technique is what I really love. It's a way to really decouple um, the stress response emotionally from how it viscerally impacts our body. Um, EMDR, eye movement desensitiz desensitization retraining, really great therapy, a way to actually use eye movement with really good guided counseling to rewrite the script of past traumatic memories which inform our present behaviors. Really cool therapy. What was, um, what was the EMDR. Yeah, it needs to be with a trained therapist. I do a little of it, but I often refer for it. Um, another really cool tool is homeopathy. Um, I use homeopathy all the time with patients, and it's such a powerful tool because it can get right down into the pattern level of where someone has created a stuck pattern in their way of responding to the world and totally unwind it without them even being conscious of it. They don't have to do any of the work themselves, um, which is great when they don't have to do that. I mean, a lot of times, too, you know, we dive down the rabbit hole and we look at the really, really hard stuff and we consciously pursue those stuck patterns of belief and those really painful experiences. And, and a lot of times that helps profoundly when someone can release something, let go of something, come to a new perspective around something and practice that in their life. Um, things like Reiki, things like cranial sacral therapy, Things like acupuncture, these are other methodologies to do some of this real deep-seated pattern energy work, um, and really valuable tools. So I wanted to mention some of those. Um, you know, it's not like when someone comes in in extreme pain with an autoimmune disease, I say, oh, well, let's spend the next year working on all the causative parts of this and getting at the root causes. I mean, yes, I want to do that with you. I absolutely will. Will, will be engaged in that process. But I also want to recognize that in order to make some of the changes 
that are going to be required to uh, ultimately, you know, uh, put this into remission, we need to get you feeling a little bit better. So I think there are quite a few better non-suppressive and side effect provoking ways to do that. Um, so I'm just going to mention a few things. Um, I really like and natural anti-inflammatories like turmeric or the medical extract is curcumin. I use that quite often in people. It can be really helpful in reducing pain and inflammation. Um, I really like using fish oil for that same purpose. It works like an anti-inflammatory ibuprofen, but with none of the side effects, and it can be very powerful and potent. I like using compounds that modulate how the immune system communicates. So I like giving um, vitamin D. Vitamin D can be really helpful. Everybody who has autoimmune disease should be on therapeutic doses of vitamin D. Um, and then a lot of the other medicinals I might prescribe for lack of time, because we're running right up on eight, um, I'm not going to go into, but they're condition specific, right? So, you know, someone with rheumatoid arthritis might do really well with collagen. Somebody with psoriasis might do really well with zinc. Um, and there's just a couple of examples. But in every process, there often are unique medicinals that can help immediately start shifting symptoms while we start to work on the underlying causes. So I want to make sure people are getting the appreciation that, you know, my job when you come in to see me is certainly to make you, help you feel better <coughs> as quickly as possible and, part, and begin a partnership and a relationship to also empower you to be your own medicine from the standpoints that we've talked about today. Yeah? Question on vitamin D. Um, I had a doctor who was telling us one time at a history club, he says a lot of people are having a lot of kidney problems because they're overdosing on vitamin D. Yeah. What is the recommended levels? Yeah, well you check the levels, first of all. I check people annually, often, most of the time. Um, about 50 to 80 milligrams per deciliter or nanograms per deciliter is what I like, so a 50 to 80 range. So that's what you're looking for in the blood? Yeah. So what if, what if um, I typically it? recommend people, to, adults, to supplementally dose at about 4,000 units a day. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is celiac like uh, anti-chrome, it's, it's autoimmune? It is autoimmune, yeah. It is autoimmune. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And it's one of those examples where it's very specific to gluten. So, you can't ever eat gluten again, either, with celiac. Right. Yeah. Or maybe trace amounts if you get your gut really healthy. But. Right, right. Do, you, do you treat younger children? Very young yeah, children? yeah, yeah. And, and something I didn't mention in the talk is, you know, what we've increasingly seen, I think someone asked the question, timing of onset, adult onset versus childhood. It used to be, a long time ago, that most autoimmune disease was child onset, and it was kind of more this, I think it was more this molecular mimicry hypothesis that was most common in triggering them. And any autoimmune disease can start very young. Um, type 1 diabetes happens to be one of the ones that is more typical of starting young. Some of the more neurological ones can start really young. Um, Vaccination-induced ones, right? Those are often neurological. But by and large, um, these autoimmune disease processes are mostly adult onset. I mean, most of our, you know, again, gut dynamic issues and stress-related issues manifest as we move and mature into adulthood. Um, and it's also, like, really sticky to pinpoint when it happens. It often can be a crescendo of it really building and coming on. But what I see is most of it is adult onset, and often, you know, it can even happen older, later in life. It can happen in your 50s, 60s, 70s. But most common, I think the age range I, I find is, you know, 20s to 40s is when most of these are coming on. Um, I do treat very young children with autoimmune diseases. Um, obviously, some of the things we talked about today aren't quite as much in play, but other things very much are. Um, and so all those same causative approaches apply to those, those cases. What else did we get to? What other kind of questions are percolating around? Yeah. I've got a question. You hear a lot nowadays about these antibiotic resistant superbugs. Yes. Quote unquote. Yep. Uh, how does the gut flora actually deal with that, or is it capable of dealing with that? Sure, they are. Yeah. 
people get exposed to superbugs all the time and don't get infected. It's because they have a really vital, robust immune system and microbiome. So there's no, no place for it to land and thrive. Your immune system is ready to take it on and clear it. So, so superbugs really happen mostly in immunocompromised people, for the most part. So in other words, a lot, a lot of diseases depend on the resistance of the host. Yes, it's called the terrain theory. It's right. the premise, and it is the theory. To me, it shouldn't even be a theory, it just is what it is. That disease does not equal micro. Disease equals micro plus terrain. And it all is all about the terrain. What the terrain of the individual is as to what determines whether or not you acquire the illness. Or acquire the, the infection. Yeah. yeah. One other question I had was, uh, you see a lot of people going to hospitals now and coming out with staph infections, which you didn't see years and years and years ago. Yeah. Are hospitals becoming more and more dangerous places? And not more well, because the microbes have mutated to some degree, but it's mostly a going to train issue. Right. People are becoming, having less and less robust immune systems. Mm -hmm. They're acquiring these microbes that are hanging out and around the hospital easier. Cool, we are just after eight. Um, so thank you so much for those of you who need to scoot um, for coming out. We're definitely gonna, Dr. Me and I stay and answer these questions. Um, we'll also hang out after the lecture if you want to individually come up and chat with us. Um, for those of you who need to leave, we got some stuff about our clinic in the back and um, would welcome getting to know you better if you're not a patient. And for those of you who are patients, thanks for coming and joining. Every first Wednesday of the month, we do this. So. Um, Next month, we're talking about dental disease and uh, how it impacts our health globally. Um, so, without further ado, if you, those of you who need to take off, feel free. And I'm going to have Dr. Mia come up and we're going to kind of go through some of these questions. Enjoy our little place. Oh, here's your jacket. Thank you.
allergies, on the other hand, are acquired. So <clears throat> when the gut is inflamed, is leaky, and the immune system's out of balance, it can start flagging foods that are not innately harmful as a problem. So we hear about people having nut allergies or avocado allergies or um, you know shellfish allergies, right? This is not <laughs> something that you necessarily can eat for the rest of your life. When you get your gut back in balance, eggs is one of the biggest I see. When you get your gut back in balance and the, the membranes healed and your immune system balanced, then those allergies go away. So um, we kind of got to be careful in in how we label things. Um, and then there was a question about hormones too. I mean, the hormones and food tolerances in terms of cycles. Do you have any sense for that? Um, yeah, twofold, I think. You know, with hormones being out of the balance, I think there's a lot of symptoms that can come up in terms of, you know, estrogen dominant states and having higher levels of inflammation and reactivity. Um, but also, you know, a common thing that I think about um, with different phases of your cycle and we should have, you know, more estrogen in one part of our cycle, more progesterone in the other half. And, you know, one example I often think about is in pregnancy when we have lots and lots and lots of progesterone naturally, appropriately in the body, it can actually change some of our digestion, how our, our um, food moves through the intestinal tract. And so I think with having just hormone imbalance, absolutely, you can see some changes with food reactivity. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sorry, so that was my question. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so uh, more direct. So, like, I, I don't eat gluten on a regular basis. Uh -huh. So I tried gluten, like, it was like three months ago. I had it just for one meal, and it was a very little amount. It didn't affect me at all. Mm -hmm. So then I was like, okay, so I got my happy again, you know, for a long time, so I had it, well, like, last week. That one did affect me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it made what I have an issue with hurt more, but it wasn't, like, as awful, mm -hmm. but I, I just didn't understand why, like, why it would one not hurt, and then one, I just didn't know if it was because the hormones were different, or... Or what was the quantity, what else was with that meal, what was your stress level at the time, what was the situation in your in, in were you relaxed when you were eating, I mean, I would think of a lot of different things, okay. not only just the cycles, but I do think that they play into it. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Dementia causes, um, I would probably just continue that same conversation around inflammation. Um, gut health, I think, makes a big difference. Um, commonly used pharmaceutical drugs and over-the-counter medications, I think, have lots of studies around increased risk with dementia in particular. Yeah. And, and I think you've made the comment about, you know, or someone made the comment about <coughs> type 3 diabetes or something. Yeah. 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 yeah, totally. I mean, too much sugar in the bloodstream is the biggest driver of inflammation systemically in our tissues. So if you have insulin and blood sugar regulatory issues, you're highly predisposing yourself to developing a form of dementia later in life. So do you believe that can be reversed? Well, I mean, you know, again, it, it depends on if you've actually had tissue pathology destruction. So if you image someone's brain and a third of its mass is gone and they're, de they're demonstrating dementia symptoms, then no, you can't reverse it. I mean, what's there, you might be able to halt it where it is, um, but if, if there's pathological changes, it's, it's just, it is what it is. And that's why dementia is a really hard thing to treat, because at least when it comes into my office, if I even think conventionally, you know, people are, this is decades in the making, and people are wanting to have a cure for dementia or to reverse it, and it's like, ah, I wish we would have been talking 20 years ago about your patterns and habits and lifestyle, um, because you know we could have really altered the course, but in that case, it's usually not possible. So, in the same vein, are uh, forgetfulness or are people starting? Of course, in their seventies, is that typical, or or forgetfulness can be um, diet induced? I remember once you said at a forum. So it's like diabetes of the brain, the dementia, yeah. or the Alzheimer's. 
also forgetfulness then, or? Yeah, you're asking what causes forgetfulness, or is that does that mean it's dementia? Well, is it connected to what we're just talking about? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I would probably have a lot more questions okay. about <laughs> circumstances and, and those yeah. kinds of things, but um, stress, someone's busyness level, what you have on your plate, um, mm -hmm. definitely inflammation, diet. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of things that I think could be contributory. Okay. I would say the biggest thing for me, like personally, the first thing I would look at. How present are you? You know, how many times can you say, oh, sorry, I wasn't listening to you, you were talking oh, about. Oh, okay, well, I got that. None of us are in the present. I mean, we're, we struggle so much to be present, you know, and so I, I see a lot of people who are kind of on the cusp in their 50s, 60s, maybe 70s, getting really worried about memory, and when we get to talking about it, it's like, oh yeah, you're not paying attention, you're not really there. Oh, that's so consoling. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, or maybe it should tell you to really cultivate practices to well, that's, anchor yourself in presence. <laughs> okay. okay, the other question real quick is, can you treat a goiter? Can a goiter, I know that it can be a lack of iodine. Uh, can we get a goiter to go down? Can you even answer that? <clears throat> um, I mean, in our country, I don't really necessarily see it as an iodine deficiency. It's very uncommon um, in our culture, but if we're talking about you know thyroid dysfunction and inflammation, I think to some degree, but again, tissue damage and proliferation, I mean, how much that could be reduced, but I think optimizing thyroid function, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty individual question. I mean, the cause of goiter are many. But it's obviously an inflammation in the thyroid gland, so yeah. we're just looking at the causes of that. Well, then you get your blood work up there, and they tell you your thyroid definitely within normal range, and then, you know, boom. So, mm -hmm. I guess I would have to come in and talk. Yeah. <laughs> okay. My question is twofold. Um, first of all, with the dimension and the cause, what's the role of beta amyloid plaque in that? And two, um, how does zeaxanthin and lutein? So, I mean, that, I, I think of the beta amyloid as, as following the inflammation. That's what it does. So, you, you get the placking in terms of the pathological assessment of the brain, but if you're able to just like somehow be like a bystander in the brain over the 20 years that, you know, this is going on, you see the accumulation of beta amyloid plaque stems from, you know, inflammatory processes in the brain and also poor detoxification function in the brain. Right? Like when we sleep, that's when our brain gets bathed in all this fluid and detoxes. So so I think it's it's more that way to talk about beta, beta amyloid is what, what it's really about, rather than the actual causative force. What was the other side of the question? What's the rule, rules of uh, zeaxanthin and lutein? Oh, they're antioxidants, so oxidative damage is another word for a major driving force in inflammation. Oxidative species. Yeah, yeah so they, they, they quench oxidation. I understand that too much iron in the brain has a lot to do with the plaquing. Well, it's inflammatory, it's oxidative. That's why no one ever, ever should take extra iron unless they really need to. But how how would you test to see if they had too much iron in the brain, or would you? You can't test the brain for <laughs> iron, but you can test ferritin uh, and total iron yeah. in the blood. So it would just show up at 